Hi guys, hope you're well. Uh, I must admit, I'm really excited to have a great guest today. Uh, I'm going to let him introduce him, you know, basically himself in a second. And actually, it's my first ever interview. It's been someone that's outside, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so one of the things I was very keen to do with the kind of growth strategy roadmap, kind of live stream and interview kind of series is almost to introduce you to some really cool people that do a lot of really kind of good stuff. They're trying to make a positive impact in the community. And actually, they're generally kind of good people that I think it's worth knowing. So the person I'm going to introduce, to, introduce today is kind of no exception. Uh, when I bring him in, we'll talk about how we know each other and some of his background and how he got started and different things that he's involved with. And I basically just kind of talk through a few of these things and the stuff he's involved with in the hope that it adds kind of genuine kind of value to yourself and the audience and that kind of thing at home. So Chris, I'm going to bring you in. There we go. Uh, do you want to say hi to everyone? Okay, so hi guys. Um, obviously, my name's Chris and I founded, uh, it's now a combination of a social enterprise and a charity um, called My Cloud Coach is a social enterprise and Donated Doc CIO is the charity. And we basically facilitate the donation of e-learning materials to students and teachers in need of digital education around the world. No, I'm sorry, it's, uh, we'll, we'll go into it shortly. But I do think it's very cool. And actually, from the first time we met, which was, uh, when was it? It was a Ryzen Design, Design Network North event. Yeah, it was and like it, late last year sometime. Uh, no, yeah, I think it was. Well, I can't remember, but it was it was fairly recently. And it was a, a Pecha Kucha event where basically what that means is that you have 20 slides each at 20 seconds. I know you know this, but people at home might not. Um, and what you have to do, it's quite brutal is deliver a presentation to time but actually that you don't have any control over the slides so that they're going to go regardless and actually it's probably one of the most difficult presentations you can ever do purely because you you know if you fall behind that slide's going regardless and actually when uh we met so it's a guy called terry who i spoke to today who kind of runs those and i think there was about eight or so speakers and i was in the audience uh, again, doing some video because I just I tend to kind of video my talks. And actually, when you spoke, I kind of I instantly kind of uh, resonated with everything you were doing. I love the way you're doing it, how you've gone about it. Uh, and then actually, in the past kind of four to six months, obviously prior to lockdown, uh, there was a point where we meet enough like once every two weeks or so, just to kind of talk about a few kind of different business ideas and stuff. Um, so before we go into the detail about what you're actually doing. Uh, you know, I guess to live off at the moment. Do you want to tell people a bit more about your background and how you kind of got to where you are now? Okay, yeah. So I started out really the most significant and relevant bit about my background is going to university to study design engineering, um, which was really fueled by real interest in problem solving. I think that's why on a level we connect because you are very efficient and quick <laughs> problem solver. And I admire that in you and other people and i also kind of like that trait about myself so I'd, i signed up to do design engineering to become a design engineer and that course was all about finding problems and solving them through design yep um i did that for three years lived in manchester and it was it was literally a life-changing experience like a really um pivotal point in in my character development i would say it it allowed me to basically do what i'm doing now um, after that, I then came back from university. I moved home, um, back to Sunderland from Manchester, and I became a draftsman. So I was designing aluminium windows, curtain wall, um, doors for the construction industry, uh, working with architects and communicating with the factory floor who were making aluminium products. And then shortly after, I was only there for a year and seven months in the office, in the drawn office. And then that company went, unfortunately, in, into administration. It was a great company and it was a great set of people who worked there. Uh, went into, it went into administration, as I say, unfortunately. And then I saw that as an opportunity to start up my cloud coach um, in, in this period. Before we go into that, and again, one of the things that I like to do is that, and if you don't mind, is almost, I still find it funny with the birds in the background, it's quite cool. Um, <laughs> is that when I kind of, I click this up and put it on YouTube, uh, I, I like to get to know the people, you know, behind the business as well. Cause I think it's good for you, but also when you kind of communicate who you are. But then likewise, like I learn most of my stuff on YouTube that actually the, 
I think there's a lot of people out there who are from Sunderland or not, you know the northeast or Liverpool or wherever that have never uh, well obviously you in theory you only go away to uni once but actually how did you find that process going from your hometown just to a big city like Manchester? There was I mean you could talk about a lot of mixed emotions within that transition um, I remember moving away and within the first day it was like amazing I got put with 10 people and we were like we automatically became a family it was really weird but really fortunate at the same time about three weeks in after the party and then all of their social buzz and everything didn't die down definitely because I think that's there the whole time but it, it maybe plateaued I, I realized what situation I was in I was like wow like I'm, I felt homesick and I'm not really that type of person but I missed I missed the things, the luxuries that I had at home because now I was completely independent. I was in a big city and Man Manchester's quite, there's, there, um, it's a big city. It's a little bit daunting because the, yeah. the, the, there's crime, there's big level crime. And it's just like all of these things that you don't get as much of in Sunderland. So that, that transition was a little bit scary, but ultimately um, a huge, a huge part of me developing as a character. I was just like, wow, this is what type of life I want to live. I, I found it funny that with, I was quite funny because when I went to, so I went to Sheffield, which is, it's not quite as big as Manchester, but still a big city, but it's it's got a different feel to it. So Liverpool can have, uh, there's a hard edge to some parts of it, not others. Manchester, I think, has the same, uh, that actually Sheffield, I think, was the most uh, safest city in the country, but I felt the same. But then likewise, that when I went into halls, there was actually a guy in my same block that I went to school with. So I kind of, I wasn't actually on my own, but it was just, it's an interesting kind of process. And then actually when you started your degree, how did you find the kind of process? Was it what you expected? Um, did, were you doing the kind of thing that you expected to do? And then actually, did you find that it was useful when you then come to kind of graduate? Yeah. To be honest, the course that I chose couldn't have been better suited to me the way in which I found it really hard to adapt from school to A-level. I found that jump really difficult, and I think most people do. I think that's why they've adjusted GCSEs to be more um, comparable to A-levels or the big to less of a, less of a jump, sorry. Yeah. Whereas university was more of a smooth transition, and that was bolstered by the fact that the course content was just so, so enjoyable to me. Like... To, I mean, we were designing chairs for the Lowry Hotel in Manchester. Just cool, that, That's a cool project. Or we were going on live um, projects with a, a company called Go Systems who do camping stoves and gas um, for these portable little um, stoves that's <laughs> used in um, the Duke of Edinburgh Ward or yeah, I know what they are. Yeah. stuff like that. So just these really cool projects. And within that, there were so many little like barriers that you had to get over Um and I, to me, that was just so suited. I often like it, liken it, sorry, to um, The Apprentice, right? It's, mm -hmm. Although it was a design engineering course, it was literally like Lord Sugar sets you a brief and you come back with the product, the sales pitch. Um, we, we obviously <laughs> had to sketch and design it and stuff like that. But it's basically just every, every little iteration is a business idea. And it's a venture that you take to pitch level and then you move on to the next project. So we did that. I mean, you do that probably six or seven times a year. And you do that for three years. By the end of it, you're well, you're well versed in idea generation and um, also a sales pitch as well. In, uh, I think it's two weeks, I'm actually interviewing, <clears throat> her name's Elena, and she taught module MEC 414, which for me is probably, I don't know, 15 to 20 years ago. It was a fair while ago. But actually, that was it was the first uh, management stroke marketing module that I'd ever done because mechanical engineering is very techy. You know, it starts off very... Yeah. Uh, sciencey and systems and controls and it's it, you don't actually get onto the fun stuff till later but actually that was the first time it opened my eyes up to problem solving with a blank sheet of paper so in that one which i guess i'll talk about in a few weeks time was almost that the there was a family and there was a child called kieran and kieran had cerebral palsy and actually his family came in to talk to the class of us there was probably 80 of us and we were in teams and what we had to do was actually come up with how can we improve his life what's he into how can we do lots of different things uh, but actually it was a real person who was sat there and you could actually physically do stuff and almost what that did for me almost it just opened up my eyes to, to stuff that i just didn't even know existed 
And actually, so I, I really kind of empathize with what you're talking about, because actually I think it was almost when something clicked for me, um, you know, whilst I was still at uni, that arguably kind of put me on the path I'm on now, but actually I'm quite looking forward to interviewing Elena in a few weeks time, because I, I'm interested to know what I was like at 18, 19, 22, because it won't be what I think I was like, but actually it's a fascinating kind of journey to go from. Uh, and actually I think a lot of people will be interested who were either on that journey now, just to you know hear from you how, how you kind of found it. So you transitioned into your first job, which you kind of mentioned, uh, that unfortunately ended uh, as you know you kind of said. So then how did you come up with the idea to actually the implementation to what you're doing now? So it was, and it was a final year university project. Do you know that much about? Do you know that? It, it now comes back to me that you said it, but for the sake of the people watching this who don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. So it was in our final year where our dissertation project, our major project, was a very open brief, and it was something that you started in the September of that year and carried all the way through to graduation. Really, and it was the last thing you submitted. So I knew at that point I'm going to have to be passionate about whatever I choose. And the brief was to choose a subject area, design a problem. Uh, sorry, choose a subject area, um, find a problem, design a solution. And that, I mean, for, for anyone who is a bit creative, that's a fantastic brief. Um, and I was just like, okay, I can get me teeth stuck into that. And because of this almost affinity for education in my final year, that was prevalent on my mind, I thought, I'm aware of the value of education as I come to the end of my life in education is almost like a nostalgia um, and, okay. a, and, a hum and a gratefulness in, in your final year. Cause I was like handing in assignments for like the last time with my friends and stuff. And it was a sad time, but also kind of, um, yeah, like it humbled me a little bit. So that caused me to choose education, in the developing world as my subject area, because I realized that not everyone had this standard of education, not everyone had these opportunities afforded to them. So I went in to conduct uh, research in education in the developing world and found the host of shocking statistics, such as 15% of the world's adults can't read or write, which is over 1 billion, billion people in like kind of the 21st century who've never done the most basic things. Like every morning I fill in my daily planner, I read on a night, you know, these fundamental things that allow me to grow. These people can't do that. And never mind, just learn the basics of education. So I was almost getting closer to a problem. Um, but it, I was in the aim of being more specific. I asked why, what is preventing these people from, from receiving a quality education? And in the developing world, the barriers are well documented. You could type in Google barriers to education in the developing world and Global Citizen will have an article, for example. And I think they've got about 14 barriers there, well documented. And for me, it became about prioritizing these barriers. Okay, so which one's the most important? Which one's the most fundamental aspect that's preventing individuals from receiving a quality education? And after conducting primary research, over two thirds of, of um, people in the field, NGOs, teachers, said that a lack of resources was actually the, simply the most fundamental barrier. Mm. So then I'd almost stumbled across my problem, which I felt quite passionate about actually. So I decided to look at um, what what other people had done to try and solve to done to try and solve this problem. And books to Africa donate physical textbooks, so you can donate um, revision books or use use textbooks, and they go into schools and ship them to Africa. Um, and uh, it was at that moment I came up with, okay, well that's not really efficient because if it takes six months, <laughs> it's very very costly. And when the books get there, not the climates that can become damaged or worn or even in the rainy season there's been um incidences where when i've interviewed guys from there they get moldy <laughs> because yeah. they're damp and it's also not scalable and is the it's not scalable no yeah. not at all but the impressive thing about books to africa is they've donated over a million textbooks to africa on pure funding shipments alone so i knew the demand was there but i knew that i'd had a more efficient method to do that and that was the donated doc movement so i thought if i could replicate moodle Basically, that was my first thought. If I can replicate Moodle and do a Moodle for the developing world, whereby the wealth of educational content in the UK, for example, can be uploaded, i.e. donated to our platform, and we'll verify it and make it available, 
and then we can allow teachers and students in developing countries to access it. So then and basically to, to answer your question, I know I digress a little bit there, but That's I saw good. that as um, really this concrete idea that I really believed in. I entered the If We Can, You Can Challenge, the Ideas Prize, when I was still at work in the August and won the, won the challenge, which was awesome for me because it was just like another version of like the apprentice or the thing that I loved. And then in the January, we all were all made redundant. And I just, everyone was saying, it was, this is a great opportunity for you to start up the, your idea because they knew how passionate I was. And really that it unfolded so naturally. Um, I ended up setting it up in the February as a, as a social enterprise. No, I think it's very cool. Because the one thing I like, and it's also something that I like about video is that you can't fake genuine emotion and passion and people talking about stuff. That actually, that's one of the reasons why I like to interview nice people that I quite like, just because it, it's a way to communicate your story in a way that in just written text doesn't come across. And actually your social media is very good, but it's almost how... You know, it's trying to communicate that with a whole kind of different audience and you know it kind of it hit me in your six minute 40 presentation i think i can't remember if it was before or after mine but it was you know really really good and then the other thing that i really liked as well which comes back to your uh, design background is actually the unit uh, that you uh, kind of created for one it looks slick but actually being very well thought out um so would you like to tell people about what that is and then also like yeah. the process to get to where you are Cool. Yeah. So, you know what, when I tell the, the story of how the idea came about, I usually stop at the initiative and stop at the donated dot movement. But in my project, it actually didn't stop there. It was like, okay, so great. We have this donated dot movement whereby teachers with documents can give to those without. It's quite simple. But the problem of accessing that material became, became very obvious. So it was like, okay, so if this material exists in the cloud, in the internet, where my cloud coach came from, um, how, do they, how do they then access it? They need some hardware. So then I did further research, found that tablets were very hot on trend. Every, every student in Africa, um, there's, a, there's a mission to get one laptop per child, or there's a, there's a mission to get tablets um, to children, e-readers, uh, Kindles are very popular because they're very low cost. But I didn't believe in that. To be honest, I didn't believe in it because I've, I felt like I believe in collaborative learning. And I feel like throughout my time in education, there's always been a projector present, mm -hmm. whether that was on Asset, is the, is it Asset? Yeah, yeah. Very Acetate, old Acetate, school. Acetate, I remember yeah. them old, old school projectors. And then obviously that transitioned into um, your, your, your run of the mill projectors, DLP projectors, or whatever they are. And so I believed in this was a fundamental bit of hardware for the classroom environment. And I thought, hang on a second. So we can de design one piece of kit, low cost, that'll project some uh, donated documents to a classroom full of learners, often oversized class. And this just became a much better solution in my head. And then through further research, uh, that a projector was the way to go because a tablet is very cost intensive in the fact that if there's in Tanzania, we uh, often speak with a guy, Oswin, who manages schools there. And there's one school in particular that has 80 students in that class. And there's only one teacher. And the teacher is obviously that outnumbered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's asked her daughter to, to come and help her. who's just finished year level. So you imagine the situation, but then but you can still it's only help and teach people every one at a time. Yeah. Student. Exactly. So it's it's time intensive, cost intensive. Um, and it's just not feasible for 80 kids in that class to have it. It's not even, it doesn't even happen in the UK. So then my design project became a, about designing a low cost, very durable, very reliable projector that would provide access to the donated material. And that's when Pod ultimately was born. And then how, one of the things I'm keen to do is almost where it's to share the story about how you got to this point because you've had help from different people along the way. And I always find that it's always nice to kind of shout them out if you're allowed to. I know who they are, but they might not want to be mentioned. Um, so I'll leave that kind of up to you. But almost you've gone through a journey to get from, I guess, the point you've talked about up to 
And then you've got our plan to go to Tanzania at some point soon. So before the Tanzania bit, because we'll get onto that, do you want to talk people through the journey in the middle? Uh, yeah, but you I'd don't have to. to if you don't want to. <laughs> no, no, I would love to. I think there's, there is a couple, there is a name that I know I can't mention actually, which is unfortunate because it's a great collaboration, I think. But so I think going back to what I said earlier, where the real catalyst to me starting up my cloud coach was the If We Can, You Can challenge. And if people have heard me speak about it before, they've probably heard me speak about If We Can, You Can challenge because it was such a great way for me to be very safely introduced to the startup world and also at the same time be given a lot of contacts. So I was immediately pointed in the right direction. Even now, like people question us, so how do you know about all of these organizations and how are you known by them because of the If We Can, You Can challenge? So the the prize list was... Um, there was like a legal session with Minkoffs. There was uh, one of the most notable ones was a, a, a year's mentorship with P and E. So I, I now have a mentor, Lee, um, who I meet with monthly. And then from an organisation as like such as P and E, they're able to point you in the right direction even more. So um, so you've, you're piggybacking on two great networks almost within a couple of months of even thinking about the idea. So that's really where it started. Shortly after I was made redundant, I was quickly aware that I needed office space because I wasn't. I was working from my spare room for around three weeks, and I just wasn't wasn't enjoying it. I mean, it was in the winter months, and obviously the start of the year. There's, it's a challenge anyway. The start of the year, isn't it? And working from home and just losing your job and all of this starting up was. A, I just felt like I needed to be around people. I needed to be in a space that was going to um, kind of facilitate my journey and also support me support me and give me advice and stuff like that so I, I was at the final of the if we can you can challenge at the baltic um i was invited as a winner of like the the lord the well the, the ideas prize the entry state the entry level prize at the highest growth potential and uh, biggest social impact final i was introduced to laura foster who was who manages the space at enterprise place yeah uh she Basically, part of Sunderland University runs a, a program whereby if you're a student, past student, and you have a business idea, you can pitch it to them. And if they like it, they'll give you 12 months office space, a thousand pound funding, and business advisors routinely come in. Uh, so then, about three weeks after me being made redundant, I had this office space after successfully pitching um, in the town. And you, you've met me there, Steve. Yeah. I know. So in the enterprise place, it's a small building, isn't it? As well. So good coffee. Good coffee. Yeah. So <laughs> a lot of people say that actually. So it's good to be in a place that looks so slick and is so nice to be in. So you can have meetings and you're on your feet, and then you've got this desk for a year. And then from there, you've got your base to kind of put your feelers out and do things and reporting every day. You meet other startups, which inherently connect you. Um, one thing as well, another early support mechanism for me was the BIC. Um, Kevin, Mark, Mark Reese at the BIC, who's a social enterprise guru, you could call him, uh, along with Kate Welsh, who's, an, who's a, the, both equal heavyweights in the social enterprise arena. They were, they were fundamental to me moving forward access and um, unlimited funding unlimited funding of fund social enterprises and then a real pivotal point in our journey was last april we met with a philanthropist i got introduced to him through the entrepreneurs forum michael dixon at the entrepreneurs forum um connected me or i've even missed if, if janice was to watch this she would be very upset because i've missed out the most fun Michael Dixon actually introduced me to a list of mentors and it had like a bio about each mentor and Janice stood out immediately and she taught in Africa. She was born in Africa, taught in Canada, taught in the Middle East, taught in the UK and then came home and set up a software company. So I was like, okay, this is pretty bang on in terms of a mentor. So Janice and I met just once in um, Newcastle and that relationship um, evolved into Janice becoming the director of my cloud coach and really being my main sound and block um, throughout my entire journey. So really, um, Janice was the first and most fundamental piece. But back to the Entrepreneurs Forum, 
um, Michael Dixon actually again. So I've got a lot to thank Michael for. He actually introduced me to a guy who is, I think he's on the board at the the Entrepreneurs Forum, or maybe he's an active member, uh, called Tony Trapp. And Tony's never actually said don't mention anything about about me, but it, uh, equally I think he deserves the credit because he was early on a guy who we approached just to become an advisor on the board. And he said, you know what, I haven't got any time for that, but I can help you out financially. But he said, I, I would be advisable for you to set up a charity because people like me who have foundations set up, put money into charities, and that's just the way it works, unless you want to go about changing the whole way it works. I know social enterprises can receive donations, but unless you want to change the culture, then I recommend you do that. So we, from June the 2nd, from April, till June the 2nd, so it took us a month and a bit to, to get all of the constitution and the trustees, and it was like mission um, register a charity, and we, we submitted that application on June the 2nd, and it took, uh, I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but a lot of people are, how backlogged the charity commission are. Okay. So we didn't get our application approved till January the 31st this year, so you imagine like, so yeah. And that was with that was um, including two rounds of quite rigorous questioning from from um, the charity commission. So we finally got our our charity registered and bank account set up, which was an equal um, equally challenging process. We got rejected by by one bank, and then finally set up with the co-op, and then got um, Tony's donation, which is now going to allow us to tra travel to Tanzania. Um, allow us to take five projectors, take a media guy with us who's going to um, document the whole trip. And then the plan is to come back with all that footage, all that information, all that user feedback and launch a crowdfunding campaign. So, so I hope that outlines the kind of journey. No, no, I think it's cool. Do you want to mention, but you don't have to because I don't know what rules you've kind of got. There was certain companies that helped you with the design development of the pod. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Thanks for mentioning that as well. There's that many, honestly, there's that many factors and components and people who've helped us out. Another, another equally significant and and worth mentioning is um, them two companies. So when I met you at um, Design Network North, I think previously, a couple of months previously, one of the events was uh, designing for the consumer and Avolto were there and Black and Decker were also there. Um, did you attend that one, Steve? Did you? No, I wasn't there. No. It was fantastic actually to see like the team of Black and Decker, the design guys presenting and showing how they um, use prototypes in the real, in uh, like on, on the box when you see a drill, it's like a prototype and it's edited. And I was like, that process is pretty slick. Anyway, I, I got, it's a funny story actually. I, when I was walking into Proto, I said out loud, I've never said an intention out loud, but I think now intentions are hugely powerful. Before I walked in the building, I was like, my intention for this um, event is to meet someone who could help me with the design of the projector. Did the you actually design, say that out loud? I actually said that out loud, yeah. I like walking into the building because I'm big into, um, I, I read positive quite a lot of personal development and, yeah, and, yeah. and positive affirmations or spiritual <clears> books. That's just my personal study. Which I've I just love. finished a book by a guy called Trevor Mowad and he does that for sports people in America and it's called right. It Takes What It Takes. But his big thing is is doing exactly that. And again, one of the, the other big things as well, it's not saying negative things because it's, it's, I can't remember what the stat is, but almost if you verbalize something negative, be it, Oh, I'm stupid, they should never hire me, or you pick whatever you want. Almost it's 40 times more powerful than anything positive. And one of the big oh. things that he's found in uh, sports team performance is almost they've made massive changes in businesses and sports teams through just stopping people saying stupid stuff out loud. And it's, but you know, so I, I, I think it's actually quite funny that you did say out loud positive but actually what you've said is correct that, you know, there is kind of science and studies behind why mm -hmm. you do the good stuff, don't do the bad stuff. Yeah. I'm glad to learn that actually, because I was, I was briefly aware of that, but it is good to know it's backed by science, even though I'm not really a big science person. <laughs> I like wishy-washy stuff and like, I like believing in almost mystical things. Well, it's not wishy-washy because basically it's almost where, um, it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but you have to believe in stuff in yourself. And it's almost where, um, you know, 
self-confidence and self-belief. So I signed up to join uh, Google's I Am Remarkable initiative. And I think one of the big things that we are both white men, but actually a lot of other cultures, again, probably some of the people that you're involved with, uh, you know, to what you look into in Africa, is that they're not as impact well actually look at what's going on around the world at the moment but almost where you know different cultures either um feel or they are oppressed or looked down on or not treated the same again you've got the gender equality uh, pay gap um but then one of the big things that google set up is called the i am remarkable initiative and that is almost about how to empower people from the LGBT community, women especially, people from ethnic minorities and communities, to almost make them believe in themselves more. And actually, mm -hmm. because often they they feel or they don't like to uh, speak up about things that they're passionate about because they're worried about being judged and different things. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, uh, so it's a lady called Nina that first introduced it to me. But one of the reasons why I was keen to get involved is because as a white man in a senior business position, if I can help celebrate and push them and lift them up and give them confidence, you know, that should help, you know, solve a little bit. So I think it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a wider problem than I think people, you know, I think that people do appreciate it. And then, you know, a big thing yep. for me is just, you know, how, what can you do to help, if anything? And this was my thing that I've done my first set of training. I'm not a qualified kind of coach, uh, for that yet but it is something that i think is really important so you know you should definitely the softer fluffier stuff is uh still really important and then yeah. just i'll let you get settled by a window before i keep talking to you and it's getting cold outside and the lights drop and save i should have probably start inside but no I, I think i'm glad that you mentioned that because i like to know that thing things have truth and i believe them wholeheartedly because i've seen them in action but it's nice to know that it is backed by science as i said earlier and the power what what is um what has actually ridded me of a lot of kind of so, so as a person when you look back in your life and you think you, you beat yourself up over things you've done or whatever and i've been getting coaching from a lady and she said you know there's only one evil in the world and i said what and i was like trying to guess what it is and just and i couldn't get it and she said intention mm. and i was just like it, it just like broke me through of like oh my god I've, I've i don't think i ever do things with a bad intention yeah do you know what i mean it just that when you look back on things in your life you can kind of forgive yourself for for like we we all have re like regrets and things that we we stew over and that's just part of being a human but then when she said well what was what was your intention you're like oh but i was doing it for yeah. Good, you know and it just that that intention was just i think it's so powerful because i found out that with you know everyone looks back and says oh why did i do this you know you feel like you did something stupid or whatever but actually you know it's yeah, it exact, exactly what you said as long as you didn't do it with malice you know people make mistakes it's all, but i've almost found that that is with like kind of wisdom and time and then one of my big things because i am a perfectionist about everything i'm it just but that's why it just keeps me kind of going is almost but it, it so i had a an interview with a venture capital firm to do with a, a big spin out yesterday and i have no idea if i'm going to get the gig or not it's a big quite a big deal but did i do my best did i do all my prep did i do my homework did i you know talk passionately about everything i could yes so therefore if i do or don't get it you know I've, you know I, I did my best but actually yeah. um it took me a while to kind of come to that you know um you know that conclusion and again just on the kind of mindset thing the the biggest challenge for me but also for everyone it's the challenge between your own ears it's almost it's what you tell yourself it's things that you worry about that might happen that never happen and how you know i'm sure you've kind of uh, had arguments in your head that have never actually happened but you know it's just but that's the biggest challenge and if you can crack that you know you can actually that's that's the the key to a successful kind of life is almost just it's it's within your own head um but no, it's cool. 100%. 100%. So we've gone through, you've developed the community interest company. You've got all the stuff, the website and the branding is very good, by the way. Um, and just you. as a plug, you did that yourself, I think. And the branding was done by my cousin for free of charge. Um, <laughs> was, she's a fantastic graphic designer. I think you should give her a plug with, just to. Yeah. So it was, it was Lisa McFarlane. She, she actually works at uh, Unwritten Studio in Newcastle. 
what she did, she wow, it was going around to hers on a night time, and she just basically whipped the brand up. I mean, it's awesome. She gave us the the assets, the color scheme, and um, we're actually undergoing a rebrand as well, which is oh, cool. something of significant significance. I don't know if I've mentioned that these days. Yeah, 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 that's cool. But my point but when, is, but it's good because it, the the big thing as well is that with um, it's credible. So this is the one thing when companies are looking to set up and grow, it's almost where even me included, you want it to be absolutely tip top. You want it to be 10 out of 10, but actually it just needs to be good enough that it's credible. It says what it is. It communicates well what you do. And then actually you can put your focus in other areas, but actually I do think your brand and that is, is very good. Um, so with, you've now obviously got to the point where you've got the product. Have you actually got a real pod? Cause I like last time we spoke, you were looking at prototypes. We have a prototype pod, which I don't have on me. But what, so what we're doing now is um, I'm working with Gary Thompson at Jag Design to basically Hello, design a yeah, so design a skin for um, for the for the internals basically, um, and that is going to be three D printed soon um, by Gary as well. So yeah, I mean working with Gary's been awesome. You know, he's like a breath of fresh air. He's such a down to earth guy who will just tell you straight. Um, I mean, he's, the work that he's done and the design work that he's done and how much he's charged is just like you. He's he's just helping us out no end. You know what I mean? He wants to help yeah. more, than, more than most, I would say. But, but that's the... I have a big thing that good people kind of seek each other out, but they stick together. So I last saw Gary at... Uh, it was called Oktoberfest. It's now called MCON, but I saw him there. Uh, but no, he's a good guy. But again, I think it's that all businesses just to have some straight heads to give you the guidance just to kind of keep you on the straight and narrow will just help you get to where you want to be quicker um, and it's good when people do that especially when they're not necessarily getting paid it just means that the, it means that their intention is good uh, because you get people that don't give heartedly which is you know that's completely up to them but you know it kind of does reflect on stuff um so you mentioned about tanzania do you want to tell people about what the what you're going to go there to do, what the aims and goals are, and then almost what the goal is afterwards? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another organisation who's helped me out along the way is Coco, um, Coco Charity, who are based in Newcastle. Um, you, you might be aware of the runner Steve Cram, or the ex-runner. Uh, he he co-founded a charity called Coco, and there's a small team of Coco who run an international development organization who do work in Tanzania and Kenya. Very early on in my journey, I met a guy called Brad French, who was working for Coco at the time after running the, I ran the Great North Run. It was really, it's all, the journey very early on especially was very serendipitous. It was like opportunity with the redundancy, but earlier than that, I was running the Great North Run um, for Coco by chance. Uh, my dad was just like, oh, I'm going to run it for Coco. Do you want to do it too? I was like, yeah. So then in all of the marketing material that like Coco was sending me, I just decided to reply to one of them saying, look, I've been doing research in education and the development world. Would you like to see my dissertation? And they were like, yeah, up for that. And I met with Brad. He liked the idea. This was like when I was in university, just left university, had a had a rough sketch, had a rough model. Anyway, that relationship developed. It got passed over to Jess, who's their partnerships and communications um, team member at Coco. And Jess is now a trustee of Donator Doc. So our plan is with Tanzania, with Tanzania is to travel with Coco and visit their partner schools. So I, this is how I see the model working. It would contact an NGO or charity and then um, liaise with their partner schools and then integrate our solution, our our pod and the platform in into their learn into the learning environment ultimately and then work one up, train the teacher on how to use it and then scale up. So the the but the idea with the trip is to really get five projectors in front of um, the teachers and students over there, learn how those people interact with it. You know what I mean? Is the, is the button placement right? Is it intuitive enough? Does the platform work? Can the projector actually project in the broad daylight? All of this, is it going to sustain in the hot and humid climate, the dusty environment? Can it be kicked around and not break? All of these things. Because that's the big thing with tablets is that screens break. The amount of people you see with cracked phones and stuff, and that's the one inherent flaw that the pod solves. So I think it's a real yeah. USP that, you know, screens are expensive. And again, if you want these things to last and actually, you know, so I, I do think it ticks a hell of a lot of boxes. So no, I think it's very yeah. cool. 
thanks the the crux with with the projector is the bulb and that the that's the reason why we've gone um led bulb which is obviously for obvious reasons but the the, the life of it and the durability of it so to go to tanzania and test all of these things and then for me personally just to experience it because i'm on a mission where I've never actually met the people who I'm trying to help properly. I've Oswin, who manages the schools in Tanzania, has been to Newcastle and I met with him and we we did like, a, we had a chat and I learned so much and I made so many notes and like all of the facts that I, that I see, I'm like from Oswin, the 80 kids in the class and the, the, the parent who has now got a daughter in teaching, all stories from Oswin. But to, for me personally, I just want to go and I want, to, I want to see it. I want my life to be changed. I want my perspective to be changed so that I have even more clarity, motivation, desire to help these people. And, and then further to that, I know exactly how, because I understand the user and understand their pain points. Ultimately. Lewis, I, uh, I think it'll be life changing regardless. And actually the, so there's a few of you going out and you're taking a videographer as well. And yeah. are, you, are you still, I don't want to say it in case you're not, but what's, what's, what do you see as what's next? Okay, we take so we're going with a team, um, and I'm very focused on making that team essential only because I think it will be rude, especially with the money raised, to go and people just to go for a trip. So we're going to definitely travel with a, um, a videographer, and uh, we we'll, we'll also I was talking Northumbria Uni and uh, Durham University to maybe get a PhD student who's doing international development or. Um, something to do with education who conduct research when they're, when they're over there and I think do, formulating some, some sort of research around our trip would again boost the credibility of it so I think that's that's a wise move and I also think to take the videographer and document I don't I'm very aware that I don't want to put cameras from western people in their faces and be like very intrusive and rude but I, equally I think the footage that will capture and the joy that will capture and the real life stories that will capture is just going to be kind of priceless content if that we need to get. I think that that will be the most priceless thing that you get because it's a way that you can then clip that up. So in two minutes, you can communicate to anyone, look, this is what we're doing. This is the impact it has. This is who we help. And, you know, we're actually doing it because it's always one of the big things. It's always great to have an idea, but to actually implement it and show the benefit is uh, so I think it's a great chat. I think it's you know very well invested money, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think that that trip with the soul would be just a, an amazing trip in general. But as you say, the 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 value of that content is going to be priceless. So to then going forward from that, the the aim of the content really is to boost our social media, a market and presence and whatnot, but also to do a crowdfund. I think this idea is very crowdfundable. And I think with the right strategy, with the right, maybe if we do the, I know Manat West has a back her business and the chair of our charity um, is looking to be a female. So like if, if the leader of the organization is female, they can do the five grand match fund. So if we, if we strategically get all of these, um, get all of these things aligned and we could have a successful crowdfund, the idea for that was going to be at the end of this year, actually because we're going to travel to Tanzania in June mm -hmm. time. Uh, but obviously, obviously everything's significantly changed. So that that was really as far as I was looking with it. And the to go into the crowdfund a bit more, the ask was going to be to for a launch fund. Okay, can we raise enough money to get 2,000 projectors and 2,000 schools and run this for two to three years and, and almost give us a runway of employ some staff you know what I mean? Because someone to really yeah. run the social media, look after the market, and someone to liaise with um, overseas um, teachers such as Oswin, replicate the Oswin model to get a team and to build a movement. Um, that's why, well, what I see the crowdfunding really coming into play with and to give us a launch fund really to uh, to make to help us run for it. I'd love to do this, and, and but I haven't taken an income from and this is not me gloating look at me working on a fantastic yeah, thing yeah. for free but i want to make this sustainable for me and a small team or a large team and you know what i mean i, I have a vision for this to get premises to have an to, to have a, a headquarters to to be a, 
a huge heavyweight charity because if you think how significant the donation of money has been, the donation of used clothes, the donation of used technology, used textbooks, but no one has thought of donating digital education yet. And I just think it's equally as powerful, if not greater. And we just need that movement to catch. And then hopefully the perpetual motion of the con consistent donation and the impact data, uh, it'll just kind of yeah, set it. I, I think it's great. awesome, but I think it's, I think anyone watching this uh, will feel that as well. And again, it's the fact that it's scalable. It's almost from a business point of view, you know, most businesses, if not all businesses, look to have a scalable arm, which is when you can really get exponential sales or impact for the same amount of effort. And I do think that this is, you know, spot on. So I think it's, it's awesome. I'm conscious of time, but now I really can appreciate it. I always ask people some questions uh, at the end of all my interviews. And then at the end, I'll ask you if there's anything you want to plug or talk about or whatever. Um, so almost, if you were to look back at your, your life and all the people you've met and the different mentors and that kind of thing, what do you feel is the best piece of advice you've ever had? The best piece of advice I've ever had? Oh. Quite recently, right, a fresh one is... Um, I read a quote, I have a daily planner, and um, I read a quote in there that was basically said, you either do something worth writing about or, or write something worth doing or something like that. And it just put, it put my, it gets cloudy when, I'm, when you're on the journey to start on this. It's like you lose faith, you gain faith, you lose faith, everything's aligned and it's just so clear and it's going to take like kind of just go global. And then you're stuck and you know, and you fluctuate between them things. And that little quote in my book was just such a, and I know it's not personal advice, but just, you know, when something resonates with you, I've yeah. had so many things throughout this journey that at different points have resonated with me. Um, but that, that quote really put things into perspective. And now in the more talk it's coming out, the real, the best piece of advice that every, anyone has ever given us is, and you alluded to it earlier, it that it's an inside job. <laughs> so you get the inside right. You have to do the personal development. I get up early to do my yoga, breath work, um, meditation, yoga, cold shower, daily planner, all of that stuff. And that allows me to be in, whether it's law of attraction, whether I'm in a better vibration, I'm attracting better outcomes, uh, or whether it's just I feel better so I'm more productive or whatever it is. If I firmly believe in the advice I've been given and as I say, you, you, you're aware of it, you alluded to it earlier. If you get what's in between your ears or what's inside your, your energy, what's in your heart, your purpose, and you get that right, then I believe that the outside will look after itself. And that, that's when your passion opens up. That's where you, your purpose becomes clear. And that's when you start moving in the direction of what you would call your dream. No, I think it's class. And I think it's true. And because even like you said before, that sometimes things seem to intertwine. <clears throat> and almost you know things have happened and they've just magically fit together they're almost you know we don't know what's going to happen in the next two three five ten years but actually i think what does where this actually becomes true is that people can tell if people are well-intentioned or not and they're passionate and they're following something and they're actually doing their best and actually so even if in the same example when you're made redundant that you actually did it off your own back and actually you've created them, which is the hardest thing to do because actually the easiest option would be to, um, actually I'll ask you about that in a second because I think it's really interesting, but you know, it's to head down, feel bad, and then just look for another job, but actually it gets you down. Almost the, the fact that you identified the opportunity that, that the bad thing happening actually enabled you to do something great and potentially, you know, like in a world impact you know that people will write about you know it all came from well it turns how far back in the story you want to go but you know all these kind of good things kind of happen so now i think it's awesome um on the other question which i was going to ask which i ask everyone is that if you were to give advice to your younger self what would it be and you can pick any age any background it could be at uni it could be teenage it could be anything um, i always think it's quite an interesting one to to ask mm. These are good questions. I like good questions like this. I don't particularly be, like being asked them, to be honest. I like asking other people them because it puts other people on the spot. Well, if it helps oh. me, and I'll, I'll just, because it might take some 
time pressure off you to think more stuff. And, and this will sound really stupid, but obviously I do this twice a week every week. So, you know, uh, I'm not going to say the same thing every week. But one of the big ones for me, which I only actually discovered relatively recently, is when you listen to music, if you can, which you can now on your Apple Music or your Spotify, read the lyrics at the same time. And actually just seeing the lyrics when you listen to music just takes it to next level to me. Just, I don't know what it was, but I only learned that probably quite recently. And almost, you know, it it makes for me art and music a lot more real that actually, yeah. you know, I might have taken a different path, you know, if I'd been more influenced by, so I grew up in like, I guess the nineties and there was a lot of really good kind of music around at the time, but actually I always historically would listen to music and I just let it wash over me. And it's only certain artists that I actually seem to listen to their voice. But actually, if I watch someone talk about why they created an album, what it means to them and actually see the lyrics, the song for me takes on a whole different thing. But actually, as a piece of like learning personal development advice, actually, it's made a massive difference. So hopefully that's bought you about two, three minutes to think I want for yourself. Yeah, no, you know what? The funny thing is about that whilst listening, it just fuels your my answer. It's so crazy. Well, it happened. It just happened. So the, my, the, the advice that I would give to myself, and this is probably completely unrelated, but what I wasn't aware of when I was younger was the ability to deal with emotions. So I would push away emotions without knowing it. I was developing like so sophisticated coping strategies in my mind that when I was reading all of these spiritual texts, it was becoming about avoidance of emotion. And then quite like, so I've been really practicing personal development since me finally year in university. This was a real pivotal year for me with the My Cloud Coach thing and also Why this, this search, surge in personal development. And actually I want to be this person, not, not go down this road, I want to be this person. And, but it was all part of the journey and it's all led me to this point, but with, I wish I knew earlier, like that I didn't have to develop all of these coping strategies to, to avoid emotion. So what I was doing was I was looking for all of these mindfulness techniques that meant that I could live in a predominantly peaceful state, which I was ultimately achieving, but it was through force and it was through it was almost like I was guiding myself through a thorned path and like mm -hmm. negative thoughts were one thing and, and I had to almost weave my way through. But then when I was I was getting coached by a, a girl called Samantha who's been life changing for me personally, she was able to turn me around and kept asking me questions and kind of coached me into realizing myself that, oh, I have this fear of pain, like emotional pain. I don't want to feel uncomfortable emotions. And she turned me back around to face that. And, just, and I thought, well, okay, so what do I do now? And I realized it was just feel it. That sounds so, so yeah, stupid. Yeah, yeah. But all you do is just feel it and allow it. And then it passes. And then and you just get through that process. And now in my life, I've reached almost a, an equilibrium of where the, the peaks and troughs aren't so like intense and over, overwhelming. I, I've reached almost that, almost that natural equilibrium state and i think the more i allow and the more good practices i do naturally uh, my balance will will kind of no, be maintained cool. i don't know I think have you means... read uh tony robbins awaken the giant within no so basically it's a good book uh, i'll buy you actually i'll send you off the call i'll send you it. um but basically what he talks about is actually how uh when people have trauma whatever the trauma is you can almost let it defeat you and things happen and then you spiral and you know it's it's not great or you can actually take the positives from it learn from it and actually you know come out of it stronger and actually it's exactly what you're saying it's almost it's a journey that most people go through that actually it's it's, it's really it's a good book um but now i completely agree with everything you kind of saying and it's but again it's almost where what i'm interested to do it's also part of the reason why i'm doing these is that for me, actually, my pivot year probably was also the final year at uni, probably actually with Elena, who I'm interviewing in a few weeks' time, where that set me, I was a different person before that time. And then actually, I'm still an evolution of that person, but I've, with age, you kind of, you get a bit more rounded. And you, you actually, one thing that I find quite funny is that when you're younger, there's a lot more things are black and white. 
And then as you get older, there's more gray and you understand why different things happen. So what I'm almost interested in, which is why as long as YouTube stays around, I can hear your doorbell again, but don't worry, um, <laughs> is almost, you know, in 10 years time, in 20, 30 years time to look back at me at 36 and be like, oh, okay. And then just how I evolve over time. Yeah. And it's almost where, for me, a personal development and almost read a lot of books is that it's, I almost view it as if it's, um, you're on a ship and you're sailing and all these different nuggets and pain points and different knowledge just help steer you in different directions. And then gradually, you know, I read some books and they're terrible and I can just ditch the knowledge, but actually it's the good stuff kind of puts you in the right direction. Um, mm -hmm. So I continually like personal development just because it makes me better. Um, yeah. Cool. Conscious of home life and that someone's probably about to walk in. I think you've, have you had the dog running around as well? <laughs> It's, yeah, the dog's been running around. It's um, been dealt with, yeah. But, uh, Don't worry, it's fine. Um, <laughs> so just, so on uh, LinkedIn, I'll clip this up and I'll just, I learned recently to post native videos, both I just linked to YouTube. So I'm going to make it like a 10 minute clip. But imagine you've got an audience of 17,000 people, that one of whom could potentially help with what you're doing now, what you want to do in the future. If you want to give a 60 second pitch, just to kind of explain things that people can do to help if they want to and also like what you're looking to do you know it, it never hurts shy burns getting out so is that cool yeah got you steve basically we've created a movement which allows teachers with resources to donate digitally to those without because those without are situated in marginalized areas such as east africa and this is really inhibiting their growth as both in individually and wider as a community. So with this new method of donation, we could literally have a significant impact on the quality and standard of education in these countries, and it couldn't be easier to do so. We have a platform set up at app.mycloudcoach.org where if you're an educator or a content creator or you have valuable digital educational material that you would like to give to someone in need, you can do through you can do so through our platform we then verify it and make it available and when we eventually get pod made we will be sending projectors out to classrooms around the world so that they can view this donated content offline and off grid um inherently in the design that's that's the way that's the way we've built it so that they don't rely on mains power they don't rely on internet connectivity so it's a, it's a real simple two-part solution donation of digital material and that is the donated doc movement. And we have Pod, our solar power projector, who provides access to the donated material. And that's what we're all about. And if you want to know more about that, that is um, our website is mycloudcoach.org. And our platform, again, is app.mycloudcoach.org. And we're welcoming donations uh, of all digital content, uh, more specifically presentable um, digital content that can be displayed through a projector, so i.e. PowerPoints, PDFs, um, and we're also recruiting volunteers. So if you would like to sign up as a volunteer, you can visit mycloudcoach.org forward slash volunteer. And when you sign up through that, you will schedule a call with me and we'll have a chat and we'll see what role you'll be suited to, how you would like to help. That would be awesome to really to expand our team. We've already had 18 people sign up. We've got a content creator on board. We're doing awesome animation. And just speak, speaking today with a guy who wants to manage the social media. So really the team's grown in terms of volunteers and um our main mission, though, is to get digital documents onto our platform. So if you'd like to donate a doc, visit our platform, and, and that would really help us out. Cool. Thanks for the opportunity, Stu. No, it's cool. It's when, because nobody actually watches it live, I have my iPad under here. So basically, I track to, for all of the comments and different things. But again, it's funny that with, for me, it's a learning curve and learning different skills and doing it. But then when I clip it up, all of this in different segments will stay on YouTube, which is the world's second biggest search engine for years um, and it's just you know this might resonate with someone in six months time or whatever and I think that's the real kind of value um, but I appreciate your time today it's always good to kind of uh, you know talk things through I actually enjoyed when we kind of we go and lift different uh, journeys and you talk about different things and actually you know it's I always know spend the next two hours kind of looking back through and editing it up and stuff uh, but no I've enjoyed it and definitely kind of uh, stay you know safe stay in touch um, you know, obviously when lockdown ends, I'm sure we'll meet up again for a go coffee in Sunderland and we'll kind of catch up soon. And yeah, keep me updated on your progress. Will do, Steve. I'd just like to say um, 
from from meeting you, you have been nothing but helpful, really, and you've been like that kind of a, a guy who I would view as a successful businessman who's made nothing but time for me, really. Do you know what I mean? And that's that's appreciative because I can I can look to someone like you even before when I rang you and I say, can I talk through the strategy with you? Yeah. And I just road mapped um, on an A3 bit of paper and just to bounce it off someone like you and f- um, for you to have that time for me is greatly appreciated. So thank you for that and thank you for having us on the podcast. I've really enjoyed this. Actually, I've done a couple of little bits of podcasts before, but not something on that feels like this kind of Oh, cool. well thought out this and, is uh, almost with <laughs> what was quite funny is that i was on the phone helping someone else out literally before we started so i generally get people on at 10 to just to set things up before we actually kind of start and it was it was quite rushed today but the thing that i love which is almost one of my niches is that i love to learn about the person and actually get them to talk about different things because actually i think that's where the real value is um, and that's what I, but, but actually I do this cause I enjoy it. I actually enjoy talking to people, getting to know more about their background. And then actually it was funny that you said that the, almost your final year of uni was like a pivot point. Uh, cause for me, it genuinely was. So for me, uh, next week when I get to interview Elena, I'll, I'll probably go all mushy. I don't know how, cause I haven't spoke to her in quite a long time, but actually she was one of the key people who helped me on the path I'm on now. Uh, so yeah. I just, I want to talk it through with her, see what I was like, you know, learn about her journey. And it's just, you know, th- that's why I kind of do this because it's, it's cool. It's fun. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I got you. Cool. Well, thank you for your time, Chris. It's been a pleasure as always. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll stay in touch and, um, yeah, let me know how you get on. Likewise, Steve. Thank you very much. No worries. Cheers. Bye-bye.